Good morning. Welcome. I, I cannot believe Democrats could possibly be this stupid. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, the impeachment has begun. Um, you know, I, I try to rotate topics as best I can to keep the show interesting and entertaining, but I, I really do think this is one of those days where I need to walk everyone through impeachment. I have had background conversations with senior admi- people I'm allowed to identify as senior administration officials. I have had uh, talks with other sources within the White House who I know, uh, friends of mine, people I've gotten to know over the years in this job. I have had talks with uh, congressional Republicans, uh, with reporters. I, I want to pull in all this information, all of these different outlets, and I want to walk you through what is happening, what is going to happen, and the potential pitfalls of both sides. Uh, It it is a muddled mess, and I hope I can bring some clarity to it. If you have questions, um, phone lines are not yet open. I will tell you when they're open. You'll be able to call in and ask your questions on impeachment. Uh, But I think the place to go is to step back a little bit in time uh, to yesterday afternoon. Before Nancy Pelosi spoke, uh, John Lewis, the congressman from right here in Georgia, he spoke uh, on the floor of the House of Representatives about his change of heart, his willingness now to go forward with impeachment. I want to play you a part of his speech. I'm going to talk through some of this with you as he talks. Today, I come with a heavy heart, deeply concerned about the future of our democracy. And I'm not alone. People approach me everywhere I go, whether I'm traveling back and forth to Atlanta or around our country. They believe, they truly believe that our nation is descending into darkness. They never dreamed that the United States, once seen as a beacon of hope and as an inspiration to people striving for equality and justice, will be failing into such degrees. I share that concern for the future of our country. It keeps me up at night. We took an oath to protect this nation against all domestic intimates and foreign intimates. Essentially, you have a congressman from Georgia calling the president a domestic enemy. He starts there, all enemies, foreign or domestic. Uh, He starts there with domestic enemies. You know, John Lewis has called the president illegitimate since the president was elected. Even before he was sworn in, Lewis said the president was illegitimate, so he's been waiting for something like this. Sometime I'm afraid to go to sleep for fear that I will wake up and our democracy will be gone, will be gone and never return. Every term, this administration demonstrate complete disdain and disregard for ethics, for the law, and for the Constitution. They have lied on an oath. Now, this is a guy, again, who calls the President of the United States an illegitimate president who himself doesn't respect the Electoral College. They refuse to account for their action and appear before legislative body. Who ha- uh, again, respect for the Constitution. He just said respect for the Constitution, separation of powers. The constitutional right to inquire about their activities. The people have a right to inquire. They have a right to know. The people have a right to know whether they can put their faith and trust in the outcome of our election. They have a right to know whether the cornerstone of our democracy was undermined by people sitting in the White House today. They have a right to know whether a foreign power were asked to intervene in the 2020 election. Wait, 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 wait. Now, we're, we're actually, we're back at trying to steal the election stuff. I mean, this is where we are with the Democrats. They have a right to know whether the president is using his office to line his pockets. Uh, see, essentially, I, I'm, I'm going to stop John Lewis there. John Lewis has been waiting for Nancy Pelosi to do something. He didn't want to get ahead of Nancy Pelosi. He had a number of people in the House of Representatives who were pushing John Lewis to finally come out because they knew if John Lewis came out, Nancy Pelosi would rush out because he and Nancy Pelosi are very good friends and allies, and he's been waiting and waiting and waiting, biding his time, 
And he's finally come out now and said, we got to have impe- we got to move forward with impeachment. He's wanted impeachment. He just hasn't wanted to come public saying he's wanted impeachment. Now he has. Now he has. And it clears Pelosi to come out and say she wants impeachment as well. We do need to play Nancy Pelosi. Uh, we do need to set the stage here. I want to begin uh, now with Pelosi's audio from last evening where she said they're going to move forward with impeachment. A Republican door is because of the wisdom of our Constitution, enshrined in three co-equal branches of government, serving as checks and balances on each other. The actions taken to date by the president have seriously violated the Constitution, especially when the president says, Article 2 says I can do whatever I want. For the past several months, we have been investigating in our committees and litigating in the courts so the House can gather all the relevant facts and consider whether to exercise its full Article I powers, including a constitutional power of the utmost gravity, approval of articles of impeachment. And this week, the President has admitted to asking the President of Ukraine to take actions which would benefit him politically. The 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 actions of the Trump presidency revealed dishonorable fact of the president's betrayal of his oath of office, betrayal of our national security, and betrayal of the integrity of our elections. Therefore, today, I'm announcing the House of Representatives moving forward with an official impeachment inquiry. I'm directing our six committees to proceed with their investigations under that umbrella of impeachment inquiry. The president must be held accountable. No one is above the law. Okay, no one is above the law. He's got to be held accountable. But what is Pelosi actually doing? She's actually not doing anything. In fact, what she's actually doing is she's signaling she's not going to do anything. What I mean by that is uh, Pelosi has been the one behind the scenes telling Democrats don't talk about any of these investigations as if they are impeachment investigations. Talk about them as if you're doing normal oversight of the administration. She's been very, very adamant. She wanted to keep the tight reins on these committees to say these aren't impeachment inquiries. These are inquiries about uh, the administration and oversight of the conduct of the administration. So all she's really doing is coming out now and saying, okay, you can start calling this an impeachment inquiry. There's not going to be a special committee formed to pull all this stuff together. So the foreign, Poli- foreign Affairs Committee will do something. The Judiciary Committee will do something. House Government Oversight will do something. Intel will do, over- do something. All of these distinct committees will have individual investigations that they're already doing. It's not like they're going to launch new investigations. But now they will say specifically they're looking for things to build articles of impeachment, which is what they were doing before. They just didn't want to be public about it. Last Tuesday, we observed the anniversary of the adoption of the Constitution on September 17th. Sadly, on that day, the intelligence community inspector general formally notified the Congress that the administration was forbidding him from turning over a whistleblower complaint on Constitution Day. This is a violation of law. Shortly thereafter, press reports began... It's actually not clear if that's a violation of law. You do need to know that. ...the break of a phone call by the President of the United States calling upon a foreign power to intervene in his election. This is a breach of his constitutional responsibilities. The facts are these. The Intelligence Community Inspector General, who was appointed by President Trump determined that the complaint is both of urgent concern and credible. And its disclosure, he went on to say, relates to one of the most significant and important of the Director of National Intelligence's responsibility to the American people. On Thursday, the Inspector General testified before the House Intelligence Committee, stating that the acting Director of National Intelligence blocked him from disclosing the whistleblower complaint. This is a violation of law. The law is unequivocal. No, actually, there is a dispute, and there's also a dispute as to separation of powers as to whether or not something that happens within the intelligence community in this regard uh, can be blocked. But in in any event, um, it's going to be a nothing burger because they're going to release everything. That's the state of play here. 
that you need to appreciate now is that everything is going to be released. All documents are going to be released. The, the White House will not. Re- what happens with phone calls of, of a lot of foreign leaders and what happened in this case is there is a transcript of the call typically prepared. And that transcript is then used to to form a summation of the call. So you've got two documents. You have a transcript of the call, which is essentially like a court reporter stenography of the call. That doesn't happen in every case. It apparently happened in this case. And then there's a summation of the call. And a lot of people have rushed out and said, well, we're going to get a summation of the call. The summation leaves things out. It, it's approved by committee. It's approved by review. Everybody's got to be on the same page. They would have stripped this sort of stuff out, so we can't really know. Well, yes, that's true, except there's a transcript of the call. From what I am told by senior administration officials, there's a transcript of the call. That transcript is going to be released. That transcript will be released and will show that the whistleblower complaint does not align. We will also see the whistleblower complaint, or at least members of Congress will see the whistleblower complaint. The whistleblower complaint will come from someone who did not have direct knowledge of the phone call, but learned of the phone call through essentially the office gossip and filed his report. What we are being told, a lot of us, reporters in Washington, myself and others, are being told is that uh, the whistleblower, the inspector general, will note in the inspector general's report, which we will also see. That's what Nancy Pelosi says they're not handing over. They're actually handing it over. We will see the whistleblower did or the inspector general did note that the whistleblower had partisan bias against the president supporting one of the president's opponents. In other words. The whistleblower is a Democrat. Not only is the whistleblower a Democrat, a a former staffer to Hillary Clinton and Chuck Schumer is going to represent the staffer, is going to represent the whistleblower, which is probably why Chuck Schumer rushed out a resolution to get the whistleblower complaint out, because he probably knew from the whistleblower's lawyer that it was coming and suspected there was going to be something damaging in it. I, I can't believe the Democrats would be so stupid as to get ahead of this, but they apparently have gotten ahead of this. Again, we, I need to break this down and, and summarize this for you. This is very important. The Democrats are rushing forward an impeachment inquiry based on a whistleblower complaint they have not seen that is itself based on a phone call the whistleblower did not hear. That is where we are. Had the Democrats waited they probably wouldn't be in the situation. And again, I am told by by senior White House sources that the transcript is not going to show what the whistleblower complains about, that only the most partisan people who already hate the president are going to be able to interpret there was a quid pro quo from this, that yes, Joe Biden was mentioned in casual parts of the conversation. The president was not insisting on an investigation. He wanted to, to see if the president of Ukraine knew anything about it. And yet the Democrats are going to base an entire impeachment on this, and they want to move quickly. Here's Maxine Waters, who will preside over one of the committees. Well, it's going to move very quickly, and uh, we met today, and we will be meeting perhaps uh, tomorrow, perhaps the next day, but it's going to move quickly. By the way, do the Democrats really want to put on display some of the biggest idiots in Congress? I mean, Maxine Waters, she ain't that bright. Let's just be honest here. She's also someone who has encouraged people to show up and harass Republicans in restaurants. She She's going to be involved in the inqu- inquiry. Sheila Jackson Lee, the woman who asked if the Mars rover could roll over and see where the American flag was that Neil Armstrong had planted. Yes, yes, she actually did that. She is involved in the impeachment inquiry. The Democrats will be putting these faces in charge of hearings on impeachment. By the way, many of these people, they're all older than the president as well, which is kind of funny. Now, what is the state of play? Where do we move forward with this? How does it shape up? I want to spend some time on that and the political fallout as well for the Democrats. We will take your phone calls if you have any questions or or comments. Uh, The phone lines are now open. 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. Okay, I got to play you one more just choice clip uh, from the Democrats. This is Chuck Schumer. Uh, This is actually a pretty hilarious clip from Chuck Schumer, what we're dealing with uh, with the Democrats when it comes to this. We need the complaint. We need the complaint of the whistleblower as sent to the IG. 
It's nice to have the transcript. We don't even know right now if the complaint is about the transcript, in part or in whole. And without the complaint, we don't know what the IG thought was so urgent. We do not know what the whistleblower thought was so urgent. So simply to release the transcript is not going to come close to ending the need of the American public and the Congress to see what actually happened. So, <laughs> Charlie pointed this out, this is essentially saying that we can't, we don't need the actual evidence. We need to see how people interpreted the evidence to find out what actually happened. I mean, you, you, you get the transcript. He does have a point. Do we even know that what the whistleblower is complaining about is the Ukrainian situation? We're led to believe that what the whistleblower is complaining about was the Ukraine situation. But was it the Ukraine situation? Uh, he, we assume it is. And if it is, why isn't the transcript good enough? Why can't we read the transcript? Apparently, we've got to have uh, a third party's interpretation of a phone call that he himself did not hear to tell us what actually happened. Again, the Democrats are moving forward with impeachment based on a whistleblower complaint they have not read, which itself is based on a phone call the whistleblower had no knowledge of. That's pretty striking that we are here at this moment. And the president has admitted publicly he did ask about Joe Biden on the phone call. He's not hiding the fact that he asked about uh, Joe Biden on the phone call. Now, as far as my conversation, it was perfect. It was a perfect conversation. Uh, it was uh, it couldn't have been any better. But we'll uh, make a determination about uh, how to release it, releasing it, saying what we said. It was an absolutely perfect conversation. The problem is, when you're speaking to foreign leaders, you don't want foreign leaders to feel that they shouldn't be speaking openly and good. You have to be talking to people. And the same thing for an American president. You want them to be able to express themselves without knowing that not every single word is going to be going out and going out all over the world. When I make calls, though, I know that there are a lot of people in those calls that are listening, intelligence people, with my approval, intelligence people and others. So when you're making a call, when you're talking to a leader of a foreign country, uh, it, it's very easy to assume that you have many, many people listening, in addition to people listening on the other side. Well, I won't be mentioning much. I mean, it, you know, Vice President Biden did a terrible thing the way he put it. I'm not looking to hold him uh, to anything. I'm not looking to hurt him with respect to his son. Uh, Joe's got a lot of problems. Joe's got enough problems without that. But what he said was a terrible thing. And, you know, he really made it a uh, it was an offer. It was uh, beyond an offer. It was something where he said, I'm not going to give billions of dollars to Ukraine unless they remove this prosecutor, and they removed the prosecutor supposedly in one hour. And the prosecutor was prosecuting the company of the son and the son. And you talk about uh, something that shouldn't have been said. He just shouldn't have said that. Well, and, and the Democrats, of course, are saying the president shouldn't have said this, but this, this becomes a problem for Joe Biden, does it not? I mean, privately, Democrats are already starting to note that Biden's got real problems here. Because of this situation, I, I want to get into those when we come back, but also some of the implications. Um, I, I, there are some some serious implications for the Democrats 2020 race. In addition to having all the Democrats have to rush out now, most of the Democrats, they, they don't care. They will rush out on this. Pete Buttigieg already coming out on this now that he's going to be the Democratic nominee. It's not just about the call. It's not just about the complaint. But we do know that we have seen no, it. No, notice how they're moving the goalpost. It was about the call. It was about the complaint. Now it's not. Played in view, the president of the United States confess to wrongdoing. He didn't look very guilty when he did it, but that doesn't change the fact that it was a confession. And right now we see strong evidence that the American president may have sold out U.S. national security interests to go after a political opponent. It, is the president not allowed, as commander-in-chief and chief law enforcement officer of the United States, is he not allowed to inquire as to whether or not his predecessor might have obstructed justice or might have withheld money from a foreign government to protect his son? Is he not allowed to do that? that that's essentially what, what Pete Buttigieg is saying 
is that he can't because it's a crime for the president to make sure that his predecessors weren't breaking the law. Just the latest in a number of things, any one of which might be impeached. And, and you got to love that. This is just the latest. This is just the latest, except it's not. This is the Democrats have decided to make their impeachment stand on this, on a whistleblower complaint they haven't seen based on a transcript the whistleblower had not heard. Uh, that's pretty amazing. And they're really not doing anything different than they were, except one thing. It is important that you understand this. I will give you that and the implications for Democrats when we come back. The voice is correct. Um, I will be keeping you up to date with all the impeachment stuff uh, a lot through email when I'm not on the show. If you want it, I, I do spend a lot of time talking to folks in the White House uh, and elsewhere. You can text SHOW to 33777. I, I suppose we, we've got so many more new stations now. I should do a reset as to why I'm here. Why are you hearing this guy on the radio? I, so I was a lawyer for six years in Macon and was on Macon City Council for a while, was an elections lawyer, and I ran campaigns, federal, state, and local level around the state, around the country, was a volunteer attorney for uh, President Bush's election and re-election, did election law cases here in Georgia, started uh, the website redstate.com, and became the most widely read uh, right-of-center blog on Capitol Hill, worked in Washington for a while have plenty of contacts within the Republican Party, uh, within the Trump administration. I do an annual conference every year. Uh, the vice president was at this past year's conference in Atlanta. Um, I'm very good friends with a number of members of the cabinet, members of Congress, and others. And a lot of my friends over the years are now working for the president. So I, I'm trying to leverage those sources for you, although I honestly I don't like to talk to a lot of them because people know that we're friends and they get blamed when I say something that they didn't tell me. They're the first one, aha, you must be the source. Uh, no, I, I got a lot of sources up there. I do want to try to keep you informed with everything that's going on. What I do want to note a couple of things are it is true. The president and Rudy Giuliani have both admitted the president was inquiring about Joe Biden. Rudy Giuliani, I've got to tell you, has been completely unhelpful to the president. Giuliani has been the president's worst enemy in this. Giuliani has all but said the president was making these inquiries to hurt Joe Biden. Uh, and, and if so, I think that's impeachable. And even Republicans think that that is uh, deeply troubling. Here's Lindsey Graham. Well, you know, we've looked at the Trump family and the Trump connections to Russia every way you can. It's about time somebody look at the connections to, uh, of, uh, of the Ukraine. Here's my question. When the vice president told the Ukraine, we will take the money away from you unless you fire the prosecutor, did he have a conflict of interest because the prosecutor was looking at his son? Tomorrow, when we read the transcript, is there any evidence at all that President Trump threatened to take aid away from the Ukraine unless they investigate Biden or do his political bidding? The answer I hear if is no, Senator. What do you hear? Well, well, I don't know, but I'll tell you this. If the answer is yes... I'll be on your show very disappointed with our president. If the answer is no, this is Russia times two times ten. And that's where Republicans kind of think we're headed, is we're at Russia times two times ten. The, the American public, you know, Nancy Pelosi says that the public gets this Ukraine thing. I'm not so sure that the public really does get the Ukraine thing. They're hoping the public will get the Ukraine thing. They're hoping that they can flesh this out and, and provide a comprehensive narrative. The problem is the way the Democrats are doing it, using the existing committee structure within Congress. You've got about four or five different committees pulling at this from different angles. It's going to be hard to get one common message message for the Democrats to push out. This is about the Constitution of the United States, and we have many other, shall we say, uh, candidates for impeachable offense in terms of the Constitution of the United States. But this one is the most understandable by the public. And it's really important to know this. It is, there is no requirement there be a quid pro quo in the conversation. If the president brings up he wants them to investigate something. That's to the, of, of his political opponent. That is self-evident that it is not right. We don't ask foreign governments to help us in our elections. That's what we try to stop with Russia. Is well, she can say that, but it is worth noting that Joe Biden did have Ukraine fire a prosecutor who was looking into his son's company. 
Now, the 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 honest fact there is, if we're truly objective, Joe Biden was just doing the biddings of the Obama administration. Joe Biden was just doing what all world governments, all Western governments wanted. They all wanted the prosecutor fired. Joe Biden was doing it. It just so happens, though, that his son had a financial interest in having that prosecutor go away as well. Maybe Biden should have recused himself from that. Given that situation, Joe Biden's son says he told his dad it was going on, that there's a problem. Well, he, he, this is why there's so much risk for the Democrats here. It was in their districts that there was the greatest resistance uh, to impeachment. But I think there was this sense that the cynical political thing at this juncture would be not to act. That doesn't mean there aren't risks. I think there are great risks here, and no one really knows how this is going uh, to play out. Uh, you could end up, in fact, invigorating the president's uh, chances. You could end up losing uh, many Democrats in the House if people react poorly uh, to this. And you could end up with a president reelected and unbridled uh, in his power. And that's, I'm sure, what Nancy Pelosi has been uh, mulling over for months and months and months. But I think she was left with no choice today. Yeah, that was David Axelrod who advised Barack Obama. And he's right. You, you can't really control this. You know, I, I did this uh, on my other show yesterday. And yes, I realize it makes me a nerd. I totally realize it makes me a nerd. I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to read you this passage from Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. Yeah, we are really going there, folks. It, it is 941 in the morning. I am in Macon, Georgia. It is getting hot outside. And yeah, I'm about to read you Harry Potter. Like it hot scum, roared Crab as he ran, but he seemed to have no control over what he had done. Flames of abnormal size were pursuing them, licking up the sides of the junk bulwarks, which were crumbling to soot at their touch. Aguamenti, Harry bawled, but the jet of water that soared from the tip of his wand evaporated in the air. Run, he screamed. Malfoy grabbed the stunned Goyle and dragged him along. Crab outstripped all of them, now looking terrified. Harry, Ron, and Hermione pelted along in his wake, and the fire pursued them. It was not normal fire. Crab had used a curse of which Harry had no knowledge. As they turned a corner, the flames chased them as though they were alive, sentient, and intent upon killing them. Now the fire was mutating, forming a gigantic pack of fiery beasts. Flaming servants, uh, serpents, chimeras, and dragons rose and fell and rose again, and the detritus of centuries on which they were feeding was thrown up in the air and into their fanged mouths, tossed high on clawed feet before being consumed by the inferno. I, you know, when Nancy Pelosi did this yesterday, I, I, I really, I, I, it would have been great had she actually started. You like it hot scum? Uh, because that's what she was doing. There's a scene in Harry Potter. You can see it in the movie. It's it's not nearly as well done as in the book. There's a there's a curse, fiend fire. Um, it's a fire that once let loose, you cannot control it unless you are highly experienced. And we got a bunch of idiots in charge of Congress. They're not going to be able to control this. Once you let impeachment out of the gate, you can't control it. It can go in any direction possibly. My buddy Brent texted me. He's judging me so hard right now. Oh, come on. You know you like the passage. You can't control this. You're not going to be able to control what happens with impeachment. It is going to be a wildfire, and it's going to consume everything in its path. You know the very first thing it's consumed? Gun control legislation. You know the very second thing that this impeachment issue has consumed? Uh, the, the PR team efforts for Greta Thunberg. Gone. She's off the headlines. I put up a graph. You can see it at the uh, resurgent.com right now. Greta Thunberg completely outmatched in, in the um, buzz on social media and the news about impeachment now. All that effort to sail her over here on the yacht of a prince to make a big issue about traveling by air. Gone. Out of the headlines. Completely forgotten. This is going to consume the president. See, what Nancy Pelosi did is she, all she did was say, I'm taking the governors off. Nancy Pelosi had put governors on the committees. They could only go so fast towards impeachment. And now she's taken it all away. She said, have at it. Go full steam ahead. She's not doing anything new, and that's, that's something important that needs to be understood here. Nancy Pelosi is not doing anything new. All she's doing is letting them go as fast as they want in any direction they want. And once you do that to a member of Congress who's all about himself and his own PR campaign, you can't control it. She can't control it. And there's not going to be any way to rein it back in either. 
I mean, we've we've heard the Democrats over and over and over uh, again. Let me play this clip from Nancy Pelosi. This is not to be repetitive. There's a point here. Listen to this comment. She's talking to a group of people about impeachment in the run up to her making her remarks last night. Listen, this is about the Constitution of the United States. And we have many other, shall we say, uh, candidates for impeachable offense in terms of the Constitution. Of the United States. But this one is the most understandable by the public. And. It's really important to know this. It is, there is no requirement there be a quid pro quo in the conversation. If the president brings up, he wants them to investigate something, that's to, of, of his political opponent. That is self-evident that it is not right. We don't ask foreign governments to help us in our elections. That's what we try to stop with Russia. So there's plenty of things there on which they could base impeachment. There are plenty of things there with which to pursue impeachment. Nancy Pelosi has essentially told them, move away from Mueller and move away from Russia. It blew up in our faces. We need to find something else. What's essentially happening at this moment is she's telling everyone, go off in every direction possible, find whatever you need to build articles of impeachment. What's going to happen is the Trump administration is going to push back. Now, I got to say, I think the Trump administration is making some serious errors in judgment here as well. I think the Democrats are making lots of errors in judgment. But the Trump administration is making some serious errors in judgment as well. Because the Trump administration looks at the 1998 impeachment of Bill Clinton and thinks, hey, Bill Clinton's popularity went up after impeachment. Yeah, but ask how Al Gore, ask how it benefited Al Gore. You see, Donald Trump is up for re-election. Bill Clinton could never be elected again. Bill Clinton, once you, once you reach the presidency, you serve two turns, you're done. You can't come back. It's two terms. That's it. Donald Trump hadn't gotten there yet. So to look at an impeachment of Bill Clinton during his second term in office is not applicable to Donald Trump headed into an election season, particularly when the press is out to get Donald Trump already. The press is absolutely out to get Donald Trump. So I think it's not the same. On top of that, on top of that, yes, Bill Clinton got a little bit of a personal bounce out of this, but we got to remember something else that's distinct here. Bill Clinton and his entire team had months to get ready. You had the Star Report. The Star Report was released. They knew what was coming from the Star Report, and they could build an entire campaign around what was in the Star Report because they knew the base the, the basis of articles of impeachment would be from the Star Report. They could focus on the Star Report. It was written, it was printed, and it was distributed, and they could focus on the Star Report, and they could nitpick the Star Report and raise doubts about items in the Star Report, witnesses in the Star Report, the veracity of things in the Star Report, about Ken Starr himself. They they had a defined target. They had a person who they could identify and they could make the enemy, Ken Starr, the vast right-wing conspiracy. They had uh, Joan Goldberg's mother, Lucy Goldberg. She was the one who connected Linda Tripp to the Star campaign. They could go after Linda Tripp. They could go after Monica Lewinsky. They could do these things. They had months to do it. They had willing participants in the media willing to help them. With this, impeachment will be done in real time. There will not be a predecessor report. There will not be one identified individual who can be defined. Maybe the whistleblower could serve that purpose. But we'll be seeing impeachment happen in real time. The investigation will not happen behind closed doors, more or less. It will happen before committees of Congress. And the president, while he will be able to tweet in real time to try to undermine it, they will be building their case in real time. This will not be you and me having to read a report from Ken Starr. We'll have the actual TV clips. 
we'll have the actual committees. We can watch the committee. We can go to C-SPAN and watch the committees. Hell, who knows? The, the national networks may run it all live on their national networks. We'll be able to see the form of the committee. We'll be able to see the form of the report. We'll be able to see the basis for the accusations within imp- articles of impeachment forming live on TV. We'll be able to make up our mind before the president's team can help shape our mind. That's a profound difference from what happened with Bill Clinton. And again, Bill Clinton may have gotten a personal bounce out of it, but Al Gore did not. Al Gore never became president of the United States. And if you'll recall, one of the things Al Gore's campaign strategically decided they had to do was to keep Bill Clinton off the campaign trail, that Bill Clinton was actually a liability to them on the campaign trail because of the Monica Lewinsky situation. Now, there was some revision of this afterwards. The Clinton campaign said, oh, if only Al Gore had let Bill Clinton get out on the campaign trail. But that's not really true. At the time, Bill Clinton was an anchor, and the polling showed Bill Clinton was an anchor. He had a short personal bump, but it didn't survive, and it certainly didn't help Al Gore. So there are real problems here for the presidency as we pursue, as the Democrats pursue impeachment and as we observe it all happening in real time. But there are real problems for the Democrats as well because, again, they're getting ahead of themselves in this. They, they don't really know what they have. They haven't seen the whistleblower complaint. Now, I suspect they've been leaked parts of the whistleblower complaint because it's a partisan Democrat represented by a partisan Democrat. Surely they have some advanced knowledge. But they haven't seen the complaint, and they certainly haven't seen the transcript of the call. You can call in 877-97-ERIC. That's 877-973-7425. I, I got to play you part of this interview from Fox News. Rudy Giuliani is just the gift that keeps on giving to the Democrats on this impeachment stuff. The, the guy needs to be fired. He's doing the president no good here. Man, I really did. And you know who I did it at the request of? the State Department. I never talked to a Ukrainian official until the State Department called me and asked me to do it. And then I reported every conversation back to them. And uh, Laura, I'm a pretty good lawyer, just a country lawyer, but it's all here, right here. Uh, The the first call from the State Department, the debriefing of the State Department. So why are they out to get you? This this story is filled with unnamed sources uh, again. I I will compliment myself because I do a pretty good man. So... Now Rudy Giuliani has just made himself a target of the investigation and says he preserved all the evidence. And it's not a conversation. It's not privileged conversation between him and his client, the president of the United States. It's third party communications with the State Department, and that's not the president of the United States. And so now all of that is going to be subject to review. Also, this puts Rex Tillerson, the former secretary of state, and Mike Pompeo, the current secretary of state, in an awkward position, does it not? They're going to now be dragged into an impeachment investigation over what they did or did not do. This is kind of problematic, folks. We do need to acknowledge that it is problematic. It is also problematic for, well, Joe Biden, and I want to get to that. But before I do, here's Trey Gowdy talking about the Democrats getting ahead of themselves. Yeah, Brad, I paid really close attention to that. I mean, this can't be because of the content of the phone call because nobody knows the content of the phone call. So she referenced the statute. The statute does say shall, but there are lots of statutes that say shall, including, Brett, the contempt of Congress statute says shall. The U.S. attorney shall prosecute if Congress holds someone in contempt, but they never do. Um, Statutes just don't say if you feel like it. They say shall and must. That's not a great uh, legal argument. And then the third argument, which is a little bit better, is the failure to produce documents, period, to Congress as a co-equal branch. You know, look, Brett, in the interest of, of, of fairness, there were Republicans that wanted to impeach Rod Rosenstein and John Koskinen for, fail, for, for failing to produce documents to Congress. I thought it was a, was a wildly crazy idea then. I think if you're going to begin to impeach presidents um, who may have a privilege or some other legal reason for not producing documents, if that's now an impeachable offense— then every president for the rest of my lifetime needs to be on impeachment watch. Yeah. yeah. The Democrats really bungled this. They should have 
force the president. I mean, and it's pretty clear that uh, they were going to hand over these documents. In fact, the president said he was going to release the transcript before Pelosi moved forward with impeachment. Well, now they've handed the president spin. And the president's spin, straightforward spin, is that the Democrats got ahead of themselves. They didn't wait for the tra- He was going to release the transcript, and the Democrats have gotten ahead of themselves. They went forward with this without seeing the transcript. That's that's not good for the Democrats to be in. Now, uh, if there's a there there, they'll dig it up. Um, they, they may very well dig it up, but it just it, it's not helpful. Of all people making sense on this, Tulsi Gabbard, who, by the way, is going to be on the stage with Kamala Harris at the next Democratic debate. Where do you stand on impeachment right this very moment? Uh, look, I, my position remains the same. It's, I think that impeachment would be terribly divisive for our already very divided country. Even on an impeachment inquiry? I, I feel, I think it. Congress needs to exercise oversight over uh, you know, the information that's been leaked. I think that it's important that this transcript is released to Congress uh, so that Congress can do its job. But I think impeach, the question of impeachment really would further tear apart an already divided country. I think it's important that Donald Trump is defeated. I believe I can defeat him in 2020, but it's the voters who need to make that choice unequivocally. Oh, boy. Yeah. Um, This is going to be a a do it at the ballot box. This is going to be a they're going to have a hard time. But I do need to tell you, the transcript is now out and people are looking at it. And there are a lot of Republicans behind the scenes saying, "Uh oh, the transcript really is bad. Not bad enough to impeach, but it's bad. Uh, I'm going to get on the phone here and talk to some sources during commercial break. And when I come back, I'll see what I can tell you that I found out. But a lot of people saying this is bad. If you don't know your numbers, you don't know your business. But the problem growing businesses have that keeps them from knowing their numbers, well, they got a bunch of different systems that don't work together. They've got one system for accounting. They've got another system for sales. They have another system for inventory and so on. It's just a big inefficient mess. Taking up too much time, too many resources, it hurts the bottom line. Introducing NetSuite by Oracle, the business management software that handles every aspect of your business in an easy-to-use cloud platform. It gives you the visibility and control you need to grow. With NetSuite, you save time, money, and unneeded headaches by managing sales, finance, and accounting orders, and HR instantly, right from your desktop or your phone. That's why NetSuite is the world's number one cloud business system. Right now, NetSuite is offering you valuable insight with a free guide, Seven Key Strategies to Grow Your Profits, at netsuite.com slash eric. That's netsuite.com slash eric to download your free guide, Seven Key Strategies to Grow Your Profits, netsuite.com slash eric. It is Eric Erickson. Welcome. How are you? My goodness. So we we have the transcript. Uh, People are reading it. Uh, People say it's not good. Welcome. The phone number, if you want to be a part of the program, 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. Um, we do have the transcript, uh, it has been released. I have not read it myself. Uh, conservative friends of mine are reading it and they're saying it's, it's not good for the president, uh, that it, it's probably not impeachable, but that it is not good. Um, a transcript, this is the, the breaking news alert, uh, a transcript shows president Trump urged Ukraine's leader to contact attorney general William Barr about opening an inquiry tied to Joe Biden. Uh, there we have it. Um, the, the, he did want the, uh, Ukraine to open an inquiry into Joe Biden. Um, let's see. Um, here's Trump's ask for a favor. This is from the president. I would like you to do us a favor though, because our country has been through a lot and Ukraine knows a lot about it. I would like you to find out what happened with this whole situation with Ukraine. They, they, they say crowd strike. I guess you have one of your wealthy guy, wealthy people, the server, they say Ukraine has it. There are a lot of things that went on the whole situation. I think you're surrounding yourself with some of the same people. I would like to have the attorney general call you or your people. And I'd like to get you like you to get to the bottom of it. As you saw yesterday, that whole nonsense ended with a very poor performance by a man named Robert Mueller an incompetent performance, but they say a lot of it started with Ukraine. Whatever you can do, it's very important that you do it if that's if that's possible. If that's possible, um, a lot of this having to do with, with drumming up uh, dirt on uh, Donald Trump. You will recall, I do believe, 
that um, the Ukrainians were some of the initial sourcing for the Steele dossier, and the Ukrainians wanted to help Hillary Clinton. The Ukrainians thought that the Russians wanted to help Trump, so the Ukrainians decided to help Hillary Clinton, and they were trying to dig up dirt on Trump. And, and you, you got this portion here. Um, now we've got, let's see, uh, we, we got the, we, we got the, let's see, I'm going to do word search now that the transcript having been released. Yep, here we go. Um, this is the president. Uh, da, 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 let me, let me read back. Um, I would like you to do us a favor, blah, blah, blah. This is what I just read. Yes, it's very, this is the president of Ukraine. Yes, it is very important for me and everything that you just mentioned earlier. For me as a president, it is very important that we are open for any future cooperation. We are ready to open a new page on cooperation and relations between the United States and Ukraine. For that purpose, I just recalled our ambassador from the United States, and he will be replaced by a very competent and experienced ambassador who will work hard on making sure that our two nations are getting closer. I would also like and hope to see him having your trust and your confidence and have personal relations with you so we can cooperate even more so. I will personally... Personally, tell you that one of my assistants spoke with Mr. Giuliani just recently, and we were hoping very much that Mr. Giuliani would be able to travel to Ukraine, and we will meet once he comes to Ukraine. I just wanted to assure you once again that you have nobody but friends around us. I will make sure that I surround myself with the best and most experienced people. I also wanted to tell you we are friends. We are great friends, and you, Mr. President, have friends in our country, so we can continue our strategic partnership. I also plan to surround myself with great people. And in addition to that investigation, I guarantee, as the president of Ukraine, that all the investigations will be done openly and candidly. That I can assure you. Now, here's the president again. Good, because I heard you had a prosecutor who was very good, and he was shut down, and that's really unfair. A lot of people are talking about that, the way they shut your very good prosecutor down, and you had some very bad people involved. Mr. Giuliani is a highly respected man. He was the mayor of New York City, a great mayor, and I would like him to call you. I will all I will ask him to call you along with the new attorney with the attorney general. Rudy very much knows what's happening and he's a very capable guy. If you could speak to him that would be great. The former ambassador from the United States, the woman was bad news and the people she was dealing with in the Ukraine were bad news. So I just want to let you know that. The other thing, there's a lot of talk about Biden's son that Biden stopped the prosecution. And a lot of people want to find out about that. So whatever you can do with the attorney general would be great. Biden went around bragging that he stopped the prosecution. So if you can look at it, it sounds horrible to me. Here's the president of Ukraine again. Yeah, I'm really reading you the transcript. This is important stuff. I wanted to tell you about the prosecutor. This is the president of Ukraine telling the president now. First of all, I understand and I'm knowledgeable about the situation. Since we have won the absolute majority in our parliament, the next prosecutor general will be 100% my person, my candidate, who will be approved by parliament and will start as a new prosecutor in September. He or she will look into the situation, specifically to the company that you mentioned in this issue. The issue of the investigation of the case is actually the issue of making sure to restore the honesty so we can take care of that and we'll work on the investigation of the case. On top of that, I would kindly ask you if you have any additional information that you can provide to us, it would be very helpful for the investigation to make sure that we administer justice in our country with regard to the ambassador to the United States from Ukraine. As far as I can recall, her name was Ivanovich. It was great that you were the first one who told me that she was a bad ambassador because I agree with you 100%. Her attitude towards me was far from the best as she admired the previous president and she was on his side. She would not accept me as a new president well enough. Here's Trump again. Well, she's going to go through some things. I will have Mr. Giuliani give you a call, and I will also going to have Attorney General Barr call, and we will get to the bottom of it. I'm sure you will figure it out. I heard the prosecutor was treated very badly, and he was a very fair prosecutor, so good luck with everything. Your economy is going to get better and better, I predict. You have a lot of assets. It's a great country. I have my Ukrainian friends. They're incredible people. And on we go. Now, um, the president mentions again, that he's going to tell Rudy and the Attorney General to call, uh, and that's really it. It's it's not a super long. It's one, two, three, four, five, five pages of transcript. There are two references to Biden. Uh, well, I would, you know, one, two, three references really to Biden. Um, you have. Um, 
You've got uh, the Biden son. Biden stopped the prosecution. Biden went around bragging that he stopped the prosecution. That's it. Those are the three mentions to Joe Biden. It's uh, yeah, OK. Uh, me having read this and, and me here on the radio with you reading these things, I uh, I don't think the president of the United States should be engaged in this sort of stuff. At the same time, it doesn't actually strike me as as bad as I figured it would be. Uh, reading the transcript of the conversation, it just it doesn't strike me as a terrible thing. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm just I'm um yeah. It doesn't it it doesn't strike me as as bad honestly. I'm I'm reading this in real time. I haven't seen it. I assumed it was going to be worse than this, but no. Um, the president believes that the Democrats tried to drum up dirt on him, and he now wants dirt on Clinton. Um, I I think that's he he wants to. Well, I shouldn't say he wants dirt on Clinton. He wants to find out if if the Clinton team tried to dig up dirt on him. And if that played a role in the Mueller investigation. And then he he says he understands that Biden uh, pushed out the prosecutor who was investigating his son. And, and he certainly hopes that that good prosecutor. Now, the, the, the prosecutor, by the way, you should know, wasn't good. The prosecutor was a terribly corrupt guy. But the president believes the talking points that the guy was a good guy. And, and the president worked to push him out. Or that he thinks that uh, Biden worked to push him out. This this is this is kind of this is bizarre. But it's not really terrible in my mind. And I've got friends who are reading this thinking, yeah, it's 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 not good. It's not impeachable, but it's not good. No, nah, I'm reading the transcript here and I'm like, I, I, this is it, really? This is this is all there is. I mean, the, again, the key passage here, let me read you. This is three mentions of Joe Biden here. The former ambassador from the United States, the woman, was bad news, and the people she was dealing with in the Ukraine were bad news, so I just want to tell you, let you know that. The other thing, there's a lot of talk about Biden's son, that Biden stopped the prosecution, and a lot of people want to find out about that, so whatever you can do with the attorney general would be great. Biden went around bragging that he stopped the prosecution, so if you could look into that, it sounds horrible to me. That Biden stopped a prosecution of his son. And there's just no, I mean, there, there, there really isn't, I'm, I'm looking here, folks. I'm looking in real time. They haven't cut anything out. They're not hiding anything. And this doesn't really seem like there's a big, there, there, maybe I'm missing something. I, I, the president, his, his tone seems to be. That it looks like Joe Biden used his influence to stop a prosecution in your country and that the prosecutor was a good guy and, and you want to make sure you're aware of it sort of situation. You're a new president, want to make sure you're aware of it, and also that our old ambassador was a, was a bad ambassador. That that seems to be it. I just, I, I don't think this is, uh, now obviously if, if you're a Democrat, you're absolutely going to hate it, but I'm I'm kind of scratching my head. Um, I, I'm, no, no, I, I just, I, I don't, I, I'm reading the transcript and I don't think this is, I mean, obviously Democrats, if they think that this is something to go after the president with, they're going to go after the president and they certainly are. And I see people say, no, oh, oh, the, the president says we do a lot for Ukraine and I need a favor and let's get to the bottom of the Biden said this doesn't. I mean, you can put your spin on it if you hate the president, and I'm not a fan of the president, but I just don't think there's a there there. You know, this is also bad for Joe Biden, though. We shouldn't undermine this. Uh, we shouldn't dismiss this. Here's Mark Thiessen from the Washington Post talking about the Biden angle of this. This is going to do more damage to Joe Biden than it does to Donald Trump. Donald Trump is is at least uh, flexing like he's pretty confident, releasing these uh, transcript and releasing the... We'll, uh, see, right? the uh, we'll, we'll see how that comes out, but I'll tell you who's going to be hurting the most is Joe Biden. It was just on your show a few moments ago that Senator Kennedy said there's going to be an investigation of the president 
president, mm -hmm. and there's going to be an investigation of the vice president because he had a clear conflict of interest in having his son Hunter working for a natural gas company at the same time that he was urging Ukraine yeah. to produce more natural gas. And so what's going to happen is Republicans are going to call up Hunter Biden to testify, and they're going to call up all the Obama, uh, all the Obama administration aides who warned, who are quoted in the New Yorker as saying they warned the vice president that Hunter Biden caused a conflict of interest. And they're going to call up ethics experts, nonpartisan ethics experts, who are going to say that what the vice president did was a conflict of interest under well, federal ethics regulations. And that's going to be very bad for Joe Biden. Yeah. I, I mean, if the, if the president of the United States can't ask that they they delve further into this situation, how can Joe Biden? Y'all, I'm sorry. I, I'm I'm looking at at People on social media, maybe I shouldn't be doing this, but it's it's interesting to watch the reaction. Um, that's that's it. I mean, seriously, I, I, he's going to get the a, attorney general to reach out to the president of Ukraine to fill him in on what we know about Joe Biden and let them pursue, make sure that the investigation was handled correctly. I just... I, I don't think that that's a big I mean now part of me let, let's be fair here I'm reading this as as uh, I'm reading this as this is Donald Trump doing this and Donald Trump is not the not the brightest bulb let's just be honest here uh, Donald Trump is not the not some sort of super genius he's not playing multi-dimensional chess and because he's not playing multi-dimensional chess and it, I just no this is Trump being Trump and this is what we say that I don't think there's some sort of deep malevolent intent here um if he donald trump were some sort of super mastermind then yeah i would be more troubled but i'm kind of re i'm I, I guess i'm grading on a curb because it's donald trump and and i think everybody else should too it is eric erickson and we do need to move into the georgia reaction here of of what's going on i, I will say this i'm already seeing the shape up that if you if you disagree on how bad the transcript is you're just a hack um I, i'm i'm seeing that shape up already which I think is kind of silly. I mean, I'm reading the transcript and, and admittedly grading on a curve here because it's the president, and I don't consider him to be some sort of super genius, but just based on the paragraph I read, I look, I, I understand the, the president is suggesting that, uh, you know, Ukraine may have a problem and they may need to investigate uh, the company, but I, I just... I, I don't view this as, as some sort of super bad thing. I, again, this is, I, I, I want to, I, I, let me just walk back here in the transcript. So the president believes that the former Ukrainian government helped the Democrats gather information about him, and he would like that looked into. And then he says, um, there's a lot of talk about Biden's son, that Biden stopped the prosecution. A lot of people want to find out about that. So whatever you can do with the attorney general would be great. Biden went around bragging that he stopped the prosecution. So if you can look into it, it, it sounds horrible to me. The president does want to find out if Joe Biden stopped the prosecution. Uh, yeah, okay. Now, do we read that as the president thinks this guy is going to be his opponent and, and he wants to take out his opponent? Or do we read this as the president of the United States is actually curious about what the gossip is? This is it kind of, I, I guess it is becoming a, a test on, on just how partisan are you and how poisoned are you in this? I, I see people shape it up on this, that if you give the president a pass on this, you're a terribly dishonest person. And if you if you demand the president's impeachment immediately, then obviously you're an upstanding sainted citizen. Um, I don't think it's good, but I don't think it's impeachable. I think this is Trump. This is exactly what we expect from Donald Trump. And so I don't think it's impeachable. I, I, I think we got to deal with this at the ballot box. I didn't get that. Yeah. Well, Siri, a lot of people aren't getting that. Um, yeah, so you know what? This is, this is not what I was expecting, quite honestly. Um, and it is not good. Listen, let me put it to you this way. I, I do not think the president of the United States should be going there. I also think Donald Trump is an unusual person, and Donald Trump, I would have expected, would have more strong-armed the president of, of Ukraine, and he didn't. So I don't view it as being that bad. Uh, is it good? No. Is it impeachable? I don't think it is. Um, 
I certainly think that the president should have thought otherwise. Now let's see what the whistleblower says. Let, let's see, was there anything else related to this? Were there other phone calls or anything like that? What did the whistleblower actually say? I'm, I don't know. I'm, I'm perplexed by this. I, I really am. Um, again, it, it's, it's not great, but it's really not that bad. Now, what is interesting is what's going to happen to people like Lucy McBath. Lucy McBath is the Democrat here in, she's in the Roswell area, just north of Atlanta. Sandy Springs, Roswell, if you'll recall, uh, that's the John Ossoff seat where Karen Handel won it. And then Lucy McBath beat Karen Handel in 2018. Lucy McBath stormed through a a, um, line of reporters late yesterday, refusing to answer their questions about her position on impeachment. What McBath did, what's unfortunate is, so I, I've got a colleague of mine on, on WSB in Atlanta where, where I've got an evening radio show. Uh, Jamie Dupree is his name. He's a congressional correspondent and has been for a number of years. Jamie Dupree is one of the most highly respected reporters in Washington. He's a radio reporter, and Jamie lost his voice. He has developed a neurological condition where, as he talks, his tongue pushes forward and tries to go out of his mouth, and it makes it impossible for him to talk. Um, the best way he can do it is he puts a Sharpie marker in his mouth to try to hold his tongue back to be able to form words. It is very difficult for him to talk. And so he carries a pad around with a, essentially a dry erase board that he can write on. And he was trying to get Lucy McBath to answer a question as she went past. McBath ignored him, so Jamie put the Sharpie marker in his mouth and, and tried to start talking to her that way and she acted like she couldn't understand him and kept walking through and and it was an embarrassing situation and a lot of capitol hill reporters were troubled with the way she behaved she didn't want to take a position and i can't imagine that she's going to want to take a position today given the transcript i cannot imagine a bunch of people are going to want to rush out of the gate on this transcript and demand the impeachment of the president on something like this. Again, it's, it's not good. Let's acknowledge this is, this is not good, but this is what we've come to expect with Donald Trump. And in the grand scheme of things with Donald Trump, I don't think it's that bad. Are we grading on a curve? Yes, we we actually are grading on a curve because it's Donald Trump. And he's not a super G. He's not playing three and four and five and six dimensional chess. Like people say, he's just a, he's a gut level politician. It is going to put swing district Democrats, though, on the defense. Lucy McBath here in Georgia is going to be very much on defensive about something like this because overwhelmingly the voters in her district don't want impeachment. And I, I don't think that this gives the Democrats what they want in impeachment, but it certainly gives them enough to open a fishing expedition into Rudy Giuliani, among other things, and that may give them what they want. So I'm, I'm putting up a piece. Welcome back. Um, I, so I am putting up a piece. If you want to call in, if you want to share your thoughts on this, 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. And let me just read you. Um, it's going live here in just a minute on The Resurgent. Um the Biden name comes up three times. The headline, it, 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 that's it. Seriously, it ain't good, but it isn't impeachable. The president is first convinced the Democrats tried to use Ukraine to get dirt on him. He wants answers. Then, relatedly, he wants the president of Ukraine to talk to the attorney general to see if Biden improperly used his influence to oust a former state prosecutor who was looking into Biden's son's company. We should not want the president to use his power to steer foreign governments against his political opponents. We should recognize that there are allegations that the Democrats did that against Trump. But what is right is right and what is wrong is wrong. Whether Democrats did it or not, it doesn't mean Trump should have. But I did read the transcript and cannot help but think this is not a big deal. It's not good, but this is Trump we're talking about. He's not a super genius playing five-dimensional chess. He's a gut-level politician and an old man. This is the sort of stuff baked into the calculation of supporting a guy like that. I just don't see this as impeachable. Obviously, this is going to happen. What's going to happen is this will become a morality tale where if you don't demand his resignation or impeachment, you're a partisan hack, and if you do, you're a noble saint of patriotic America. But it is silly it's stupid it just isn't that big a deal it's trump being trump vote against him if you don't like him but impeachment is silly it is silly he mentions biden three times 
There's just there's 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 not a there there. And by the way, the Democrats did try to use Ukraine to dig up dirt on him. And again, it's 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 not in, it's just not impeachable in my mind. Um, the more frustrating part here is that this is going to be some sort of um, morality tale. Um, this is, by the way, uh, Josh Holmes from McConnell, from Mitch McConnell's team does, does say a couple of things. Um, the crowd strike reference is newsworthy and other utterly lost on everyone. I'm guessing this is a reference to the ongoing investigation into the Russian election interference. Crowd strike was the firm who the DNC hired after it was hacked. It's pretty unfortunate that we needed to disclose this section publicly. The conflating of two sections favor and, and Biden section of the transcript is unbelievably irresponsible. Um, I, nah, I, I mean, obviously, if you hate the president, you, you think this is bad. If you like the president, you're going to defend it. I think it's bad. I just don't think it's impeachable. Um, and I think the more unfortunate thing is people are trying to draw partisan lines of saying you got to pick a side on this now. You got to pick a side, and I don't know that you got to pick a side. Um, all right, I, I'm going to go to the phones. Um, we have Jake who is in Loganville. Jake, are you a troll calling? Uh, hello. Hi there, Jake. Yeah, hi. Good to see you. Well, I heard you saying earlier that uh, people are, you know, calling everybody who doesn't think this is impeachable like a liar and a hack, and I completely agree. It, it's absurd. Um, what you know, I've seen everything that's going on today. I'm seeing, you know, the Democrats trying to play the impeachment game. I'm seeing that 16 year old, whatever her name is, being, you know, playing a politician. It's crazy. It's- yeah, it, it is. Um... Jake, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to cut off Jake, but I could. He he had that troll vibe to him, building up to something. Um, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm I'm just so. Can I give you a little secret here? Should give you a little trade secret or a secret in radio. When you call in, you you actually can't get through with undisclosed numbers. And so when you call and you say you're calling from uh, somewhere in Georgia and we can see your phone number and you're actually somewhere in California, it raises red flags. Just going to say. All right. Can we move on? I mean, I, we do have other stuff we need to play out here. And this is a hodgepodge show. I swear if there were people listening today, they'd say, why are we doing that? Why are we picking up this show? Well, this is an unusual day. We've got a lot of breaking news happening live, and we're covering it live. Um, I, I do want to play this clip by Ian Brimmer, who was on TV last night. Ian Brimmer is a is a uh, geopolitical analyst. Uh, he's on TV a lot talking about foreign affairs, and he does make a very good point here about the Biden implications. Yeah, we, we don't have those facts yet. Jane's right. This We should not be talking about pushing for a transcript of the call, which is what Joe Biden said he wanted yesterday. That would be a mistake. First of all, it's a bad precedent to set. Uh, you want presidents to be able to conduct diplomacy without the necessity of that concern. Yes, but when there's a question of corruption, why not say the transcript? No, because they'll redact it and because they'll only put it out if it's useful to tell their story. What you need, as Jane just said, is the whistleblower complaint. You have that. That's actually the legal process. Right. That's what we should see. Biden does have a problem here, by the way. I mean, I, I have to say, $50,000 a month for Hunter Biden clearly uh, to be selling influence because otherwise no one would ever pay him that kind of money for a company that frankly was pretty corrupt and has been uh, before and has been since under And um, is that Joe Biden's fault or problem? And, uh, no, but it's hard to imagine Joe Biden wasn't aware of it. And I think that I, I expect that President Obama, if he had known about the reality of this situation, would have probably told Biden, get rid of this. Like, we, we shouldn't have your son working in this situation. That would have cost him something. And I, and I, I feel like even if maybe Biden wasn't aware, but Biden should have been aware that that would cause, a, uh, cause an issue for him. So, I mean, if this ends up being an Al Franken moment where he gets thrown under the bus so the Democrats can be seen as actually the party that cares about values and rule of law, then maybe that's what they need to do. Yeah, see, I I think that Joe Biden winds up getting hurt by this. I I really do think that Biden winds up getting hurt. Uh, In fact, uh, we're noticing a couple of things happening in the early state polling. 
is that Joe Biden's polling is beginning to collapse and Elizabeth Warren's polling is beginning to go up. Uh, the Biden polling, it looks like Elizabeth Warren is starting to gain a pulse with black voters. And I think as people tie this together and start to realize that if Biden's got problems here and as long as Biden is around, the Democrats don't have a clear path to go after the president because of ethics issues, it begins to hurt him. Uh, it begins to hurt Biden. Now, uh, I, I want to get back into the political implications here in Georgia because this is normally the hour uh, that we that we go to this. The AJC is running this story. Let, let, I'm just going to read it to you from them. Let's take stock of the last 24 hours. Uh, when yesterday's jolt was published, this is the, the morning political column at the AJC, not a single Georgia congressman had endorsed opening an impeachment inquiry. By the time we left the office for the evening, four out of the five of the state's U.S. House Democrats, Hank Johnson, John Lewis, Sanford Bishop, and David Scott, were on record in favor of one. A watershed moment was Lewis's fiery noontime speech from the well of the House, but just as momentous was the stream of frontline Democrats who began vouching for impeachment over the preceding day. Those who are most politically vulnerable, the, the Democrats, the ones Nancy Pelosi had spent months trying to shield from politically damaging votes, are, well, the ones we didn't really hear from. Take Lizzie Fletcher, a political newcomer who capitalized on suburban resentment of Trump to flip a Houston area seat. Uh, she says that there should be impeachment. More than half of the 40-some frontliners came out in support of an impeachment probe by the end of Tuesday. One Democrat who wasn't on the list Lucy McBath, her office didn't respond, and she outright ignored questions from Jamie Dupree. She's not alone here. Now, I want to go back real quick, and I want to replay some audio I played in the first hour. If you weren't joining in, I want to play John Lewis's audio on the floor of the House. He largely helped persuade Pelosi to move forward in this direction. Today, I come with a heavy heart deeply concerned about the future of our democracy. And I'm not alone. People approach me everywhere I go, whether I'm traveling back and forth to Atlanta or around our country. They believe, they truly believe that our nation is descending into darkness. They never dreamed that the United States, once seen as a beacon of hope, and as an inspiration to people striving for equality and justice, will be failing into such degrees. I share that concern for the future of our country. It keeps me up at night. We took an oath to protect this nation against all domestic enemies and foreign enemies. Sometimes I'm afraid to go to sleep for fear that I will wake up and our democracy will be gone, will be gone, and never return. Every term, this administration demonstrates complete disdain and disregard for ethics, for the law, and for the Constitution. They have lied on an oath. They refuse to account for their action and appear before legislative body who have the constitutional right to inquire about their activities. The people have a right to inquire. They have a right to know. The people have a right to know whether they can put their faith and trust in the outcome of our election. They have a right to know whether the cornerstone of our democracy was undermined by people sitting in the White House today. They have a right to know whether a foreign power were asked to intervene in the 2020 election. They have a right to know whether the president is using his office to line his pockets. Mr. Speaker, the people of this nation realize that if they had committed even half of the possible violation, the federal government would be swift to seek justice. We cannot delay. We must not wait. Now is the time to act. I have been patient when we tried every other path and used every other tool. We will never find the truth unless we use the power given to the House of Representatives and the House alone to begin an official investigation as dictated by the Constitution. The future of our democracy is at stake. 
there come a time when you have to be moved by the spirit of history to take action to protect and preserve the integrity of our nation. I believe, I truly believe, the time to begin impeachment proceedings against this president has come. To delay or to do otherwise would betray the foundation of our democracy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There you have John Lewis. I, I also lo- appreciate the length of his clip because there was a leaf blower standing right outside my office, and uh, I could put my microphone on mute and let John Lewis talk. There was a method to my madness playing all of this without talking over John Lewis, which is something I normally don't do, uh, but I wouldn't be able to drown out the noise of the leaf blower, so there we have it. Um, so uh, John Lewis really is the one who pushed this. He's been wanting this all along. And it was him, a, a, a Georgia congressman who, you know, Hank Lewis beat him out of the, or Hank Johnson, rather, beat him out of the gate. Hank Johnson came out and uh, said he wanted impeachment. He's been dying to get out there. He beats John Lewis, and that kind of forces John Lewis's hand. And John Lewis now, um, he's got to come out. Well, John Lewis coming out forced Nancy Lewis. It's a series of dominoes uh, that fell. You, you had a lot of Democrats moving forward. You had Hank Johnson come out that pushed John Lewis out. A lot of moderate Democrats uh, then came out uh, after John Lewis that then pushed Nancy Pelosi out. And that then moves us forward to the path of impeachment. And, of course, what we're going to have now is some massive level of virtue uh, signaling. And that massive level of virtue signaling will... Um, essentially say that if you don't support impeachment, you're a bad guy. And if you do support impeachment, you're a saint. Uh, I don't think this is good, but I don't think it's impeachable. That being said, there's one element here that is missing. We know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the president of the United States held up funding for Ukraine a week before his phone call with the Ukrainian president. I want to know why. And I think if it is related, then, yeah, I I do think there's an impeachment thing here. If the president was withholding Ukrainian money to get them to investigate Joe Biden, then absolutely it is impeachable. And and I want to see that documentation. I want to I I want the evidence and I want to be not just a whistleblower who has third hand accounts of this. I actually want to know. I I, want to see what this is. I, I don't I think the transcript is bad. But I don't think it's damning in the way that you would need for impeachment. But is there something more? What is the does the whistleblower actually know something? Of course, the whistleblower it looks like we're gonna it's gonna be named Christine Blasey Ford, and Democrats will say you got to believe all whistleblowers. But I I just I'm I'm thinking there's gonna be something else here, and also. Are the Democrats going to toss Biden now? If the Democrats are going to toss Biden, um, are they going to go with a more radical leftist pick? Uh, That's something we need to weigh in here as well. Here's my thing. My gut reaction here is this really is not impeachable based on what we have. Um, It is certainly something that will probably lead more people to vote against the president. In fact, I don't think that people will want to support the president after this. Uh, They will at the gut level understand this is gross. They may not think it's impeachable. They may not want to have an impeachment fight, but they understand this is kind of gross. And they don't want to support him in 2020. But not supporting the president in 2020 versus impeaching him are two different things, and that could backfire on the Democrats. Of course, this is signaling maybe there is a there there, and and proceeding with investigation may turn up something. So I got to fill you in on something that's happening. By the way, I, I am live. It is 53 after the hour, and, and I'm I'm live, and this is happening right now. Uh, a number of blue check marked reporters on social media are circulating a portion of the transcript of the president's call with Ukraine, wherein he comments on the 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 lovely buildings and people in Ukraine, and it's just an absurd conversation of the president praising random things in Ukraine to show how much he loves the country. And it's not real. The daily show made it up. Um, it's, it's, it's not real. Um, it just, it's, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, 
people are just falling for all sorts of fake stuff today. Hey, hey, you know, can we take a can we take a quick time out from this story and get to something? Hang on. Let me get this off the printer. Uh, yeah, off the printer. Yeah, I, I, I want to step out of it. I've been talking about impeachment for two hours. I got other stuff I want to talk about. Impeachment, I realize it's really important. We do we do need to cover the lay of the land here. But can we talk about Carson King for just a minute, please? Carson King helped raise a million dollars for the University of Iowa uh, Steed Family Children's Hospital. So he was on Sports Center ten days ago. He was a guy in a crowd, and he was holding up a sign on on Game Day, on ESPN Game Day, for beer money. And he raised over one point one four million dollars in donations. He had a big sign that you could just essentially Venmo him money for beer money, and he got over a million dollars just by holding up a sign on Sports Center. And he donated the money to a children's hospital. So the Des Moines Register wanted to write a profile of this 20-something. And the reporter for the Des Moines Register went into Carson King's social media and found tweets from when he was 16 years old in 2011. In 2011. And decided to destroy Carson King because he had some some uh, tweets. He apparently had been listening to a a comedian and was tweeting along and and saying some terrible terribly. They were racist. I mean, they flat out were racist things in 2011. And the Des Moines Register reporter, you should know, has himself a history of saying racist things and use of the N word in his social media profile from years ago. Well, the social media reporter for the or or the the media reporter for the Des Moines Register locked his own Twitter account so people could not see the bad things he's tweeted and then decided to destroy Carson King, a man who just raised one point one four million dollars for charity. King beat the Des Moines Register out and apologized. Anheuser-Busch was going to match donations and, and also provide beer money for, for Carson King. They've yanked their sponsorship and apologized for having anything to do with the guy who raised money for charity. Ridiculous. And the Des Moines Register, by the way, says that it is, it's, it's terrible. And it's the, the Des Moines Register comes out and says, well, this was a legitimate news story. This is who this person is. Well, this is who this person was in 2011. And he hasn't done that since he was 16 years old. He stayed on Twitter. He hadn't continued to be that way, but the Des Moines Register decided to destroy him. And it, what's so fascinating here is this is boomeranged on the reporter whose uh, media career itself is probably over. I personally think the Des Moines Register should be driven into bankruptcy. Its building tore down, torn down, and salt poured all over the ruins. Uh, th- this is th- we're more and more we see, particularly in sports. When a young kid gets into college and starts winning a lot of games, sports reporters are the ones who are most notorious for going back to when they were on social media, 14, 15, 16 years old, and find the dumb things they said as immature kids. And they're still rather immature kids, but they've grown up some. They know better. They moved on. They don't have a continued history of doing this, and yet the media turns it into big stories. And it it really, really, really unfortunate. That's, that's... I. uh, I hate to see it happen. I'm good to see it blow up on the reporter, but I I think there need to be repercussions. We live in a day and age where the president of the United States is able to call the media the enemy of the people, and they continue to prove him right in doing these sorts of things. And that's really unfortunate. And until the media is willing to stand up and exercise some discretion in these sorts of things, they continue to get what they deserve through their own destroying of their own professional reputations. It's, It's really disappointing. If you don't know your numbers, you don't know your business. But the problem growing businesses have that keeps them from knowing their numbers, well, they got a bunch of different systems that don't work together. They've got one system for accounting. They've got another system for sales. They have another system for inventory and so on. It's just a big inefficient mess. Taking up too much time, too many resources, it hurts the bottom line. Introducing NetSuite by Oracle, the business management software that handles every aspect of your business in an easy-to-use cloud platform. It gives you the visibility and control you need to grow. With 
NetSuite, you save time, money, and unneeded headaches by managing sales, finance, and accounting orders and HR instantly right from your desktop or your phone. That's why NetSuite is the world's number one cloud business system. Right now, NetSuite is offering you valuable insight with a free guide, seven key strategies to grow your profits at NetSuite.com slash Eric. That's NetSuite.com slash Eric to download your free guide, seven key strategies to grow your profits, NetSuite.com slash Eric. Welcome, it is Eric Erickson here, the Eric Erickson Show. The phone number, 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. From the North Georgia Mountains to the Florida Line, from the Chattahoochee to the coast, covering all of Georgia, uh, and and streaming live on Facebook, where you, you could have, in the last hour, uh, seen me in real time reading the transcript as it came out. I was seeing all sorts of Republicans say, oh, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad, and I read it. And I was kind of looking for the bad, and I didn't really see the out there. It wasn't good. I don't think the president should be doing this, but impeach. I don't think it's impeachable. Um, let me just read you from uh, Kim Strassel at the Wall Street Journal. Having read the Department of Justice's Trump Ukraine release, here's the real story. This is another internal attempt to take out the president on the basis of another non-smoking gun. As to call or transcript itself, uh, Trump's actual favor is that Ukraine looked backwards to see what happened in the 2016 election. This is a legitimate ask since election meddling looks to have come from both Russia and Ukraine. Indeed, this is a big enough issue that we find out this morning the U.S. Attorney John Durham is looking into what role Ukraine played in the FBI investigation. It is actually Zelensky who brings up Rudy Giuliani saying they can't wait to meet him. And it is Zelensky who references the investigation as he goes on to promise that all investigations will be done openly and candidly. Trump says good and expresses worries that a good prosecutor was shut down, mentions Biden's son, and that Biden bragged he stopped the prosecution, ends that bit with it sounds horrible to me. Trump's several references to Giuliani are mostly to say what a great guy he is. He says he will have Giuliani and Attorney General Barr call. He asks Zelensky to speak, work with both, and never mind because uh, Department of Justice in a statement says the president has not spoken to the Attorney General about investigating Biden and has not asked the Attorney General to contact Ukraine. Also, Barr has not communicated with Ukraine on this or any other subject. Meanwhile, the Inspector General back in August referred this to the Department of Justice as a potential violation of campaign finance law based on the whistleblower complaint. The criminal division evaluated and determined there was no violation. All relevant components of the department agreed with this legal conclusion. The whistleblower... Look at the nugget referenced in the Office of Legal Counsel opinion. The Inspector General report found some indication of an arguable political bias on the part of the complainant in favor of a rival political candidate. There you have it from Kim Strassel at the Wall Street Journal. I, I honestly, there are days like this where I wish the president would just say, I made America great again, I'm going to go home and leave it to Pence. Uh, this story isn't helpful to him. I, I don't think it's helpful to have the president do stuff like this. Uh, I think it's a distraction from larger issues. We as a nation have completely become distracted. Uh, we have become distracted from from foreign threats that need to be paid attention to. And I, I there are days like this where I think, you know, President Pence would actually be really good. But I still don't think it's impeachable. I was headed into this transcript this morning, hearing all these people saying, oh, this is really, really bad. Thinking, oh, well, they got him. He's going to have to resign or there's going to be impeachment. And I look at the transcript and like, really? That's it? Really? It's not good, but it's Trump. It's Trump being Trump. This is the sort of stuff we expect from Donald Trump. And this is the sort of stuff that will be used at the ballot box about Donald Trump. I, I don't see it as impeachable. And, of course, you, you know, the, the interesting situation here is that um, those who hate the president immediately see it all as impeachable. This is terrible. This is bad. The president's got to be impeached. He's got to go. And the people who love the president say, oh, he did nothing wrong. No, the president should not have done it. We should all concede the president should not have done this. And this is not situational ethics. Uh, what is right is right, and what is wrong is wrong, and it doesn't depend on what the other side did. There is credible evidence that the Democrats did seek information from Ukraine. More particularly, there is evidence that the Clinton campaign had some former Ukrainian officials trying to feed them information about Paul Manafort. And there's credible information 
uh, that the Obama administration tried to get information on Manafort, particularly as they became concerned the president was a tool for the Russians. you you got to keep that perspective here, uh, that the Obama administration was doing this because they really did believe, they believed the worst about Donald Trump, and everything they did was premised on the worst about Donald Trump, and they really did believe he was a tool for the Russians. And so when they heard about the Paul Manafort stuff and, and the Clinton team fed them information, they were trying to find that information. You, you do need to keep some perspective on why they were doing it. It wasn't just to get Trump with dirt. It was because they really believed he was a Russian agent uh, because they saw Paul Manafort working for him and these other people. But whether what they did was right or wrong doesn't matter as as to whether or not the president is right or wrong. And I don't think the president should have done this. Do you want a Democratic president doing this? Just ask yourself that. Do you want a Democratic president doing something like this? I think the response should, in fairness, be no. You don't want a Democratic president doing something like this. You don't want a Democratic president digging up dirt. But is it impeachable? Is it a high crime or misdemeanor? I I will tell you where I am on this. If the president of the United States did withhold them, we, we know objectively the president withheld money from Ukraine. If there is substantive evidence, credible evidence, not just a partisan rumor mongering or whatnot, if there was actual credible evidence that the president did withhold the money from Ukraine, to pressure them into investigating Joe Biden, yeah, I think the president needs to be impeached. And I'll go on and put myself out on a limb out there. You can hold me accountable for it later. Uh, I I do think if the president is is withholding American money lawfully appropriated by Congress and doing so to pressure a foreign government to investigate a political opponent, yeah, I I, I think that president needs to be investigated. I wouldn't want a Democrat to do that. I don't want a Republican doing that. Um, There's my bar for impeachment. But the president merely raising this in a phone call with Zelensky, no, I don't think he should have done it, but this is Trump being Trump. I mean, Trump is is not your standard politician. He doesn't play by the rules other people do. He's not quite as as in clue with what he should or should not do. He doesn't have an, an internal an internal dialogue with himself over whether or not he should do things. He just does them. And this was baked into the calculation when Trump was elected. And I didn't support him in 2016. Uh, and I'll support him in 2020 against one of these nut job Democrats who are running, but I would really prefer to vote for President Pence and Vice President Nikki Haley. And I think most Republicans at this point would as well. They don't want to say that publicly. I mean, and come on, if we're really honest here, the Democrats would be doing a favor to the Republicans by pushing Trump out the door. But I do support the Constitution. And I do not believe, based on my understanding of the Constitution, that it is an impeachable offense for the president of the United States to make lawful inquiries as to what prior administrations did or did not do, particularly when the president seems to be under the belief, probably because he got it all Fox News, the president does seem to be under the belief that what Joe Biden did was improper and that it possibly was criminal, that it was possibly done to protect his son. And if he wanted to make an inquiry into that, I I, I don't think he should have. He should have let other people do it, but he did it. Uh, I don't think he should have, but there you have it. Now, all of that being said, uh, here's what we know. Uh, he told the president of Ukraine the attorney general would be reaching out. The attorney general has never had a conversation with the president about reaching out, and the attorney general has, in fact, never reached out. So there's that. Um, now I assume we can now move on. I've successfully placated everyone. Uh, we have covered this thoroughly. We can move on. Uh, I do want to address the Biden angle here just a little bit more. Go back, play one more time the Ian Brimmer clip, and then why this is becoming a problem. I've got some audio of Joe Biden himself that kind of shows why it's a problem. Yeah, we, we don't have those facts yet. Jane's right. This, we should not be talking about pushing for a transcript of the call, which is what Joe Biden said he wanted yesterday. That would be a mistake. First of all, it's a bad precedent to set. Uh, you want presidents to be able to conduct diplomacy without the necessity of that concern. Yes, but when there's a question of corruption, why not say the transcript? No, because they'll redact it and because they'll only put it out if it's useful to tell their story. What you need, as Jane just said, is the whistleblower complaint. You have that. That's actually the legal process. Right. That's what we should see. Biden does have a problem here, by the way. I mean, I, I have to say, $50,000 a month for Hunter Biden 
clearly uh, to be selling influence because otherwise no one would ever pay him that kind of money for a company that frankly was pretty corrupt and has been uh, before and has been since under And um, is that Joe Biden's fault or problem? And, uh, no, but it's hard to imagine Joe Biden wasn't aware of it. And I think that I, I expect that President Obama, if he had known about the reality of this situation, would have probably told Biden, get rid of this. Like, we, we shouldn't have your son working in this situation. That would have cost him something. And I, and I, I feel like even if maybe Biden wasn't aware, but Biden should have been aware that that would cause, a, uh, cause an issue for him. So, I mean, if this ends up being an Al Franken moment where he gets thrown under the bus so the Democrats can be seen as actually the party that cares about values and rule of law, then maybe that's what they need to do. If they really do care about the, the rule of law, maybe they need to get rid of him. Well, listen to the reporters in this with Joe Biden. We know who Donald Trump is. It's time to let the world know who we are. Thank you very much. No, hear, hear all that? He, he, the, you got the reporters yelling at Biden over this stuff, and he's not going to answer them. I... Uh, Andre Mitchell from NBC, MSNBC kind of puts this in perspective, though, what the Trump campaign would do with it. As long as Joe Biden stays on the ballot, as long as Biden is a candidate, and again, he is the front runner. Elizabeth, Edward, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Warren is starting to go up on the polls, uh, go up in the polls on Joe Biden. She's starting to get a pulse with black voters. That's going to help her, and that could potentially help her beat Biden. She's starting to move ahead of him in early states. And wow, Bernie Sanders is completely collapsing. But listen to this if Biden stays in the race. We know the Biden folks are concerned that this is what they might call Hillary 2.0, the feeling that back in 2016, the president was able to paint a picture of Hillary Clinton that was not accurate. Uh, despite the email controversy, that became his sole message. But by repeating it over and over again, he has learned that it works for him politically. Yeah. Uh, repeating it over and over again. Um if Biden stays in the race, I have said all along, I thought Joe Biden was going to be the Democrats nominee. I think that Joe Biden now can't be the Democratic nominee. Because if Biden is the Democratic nominee with this story out there, it provides something for Trump to pivot to to help him. Um, I don't know that Donald Trump wins reelection with the story out there. Now, you may say what you, you say is no big deal. It's not impeachable. But voters understand that it's gross. I mean, it is unseemly for the president to be doing this. The president has other people who could do this sort of stuff. It is, it's gross. Um, but I don't think that it's as bad as some of my friends viewed it as uh, when I read it. And I also don't think that it is something that's impeachable. Now, if we do find that the president really did withhold that money from Ukraine to pressure an investigation to Biden, yeah, I, I totally think that's impeachable. Um, because what the president is doing is Congress appropriated money, and the president is ignoring a congressional a, a law to benefit himself. And I think that's impeachable. But if Biden stays on the ballot for the Democrats, the Democrats have a huge problem here. The Democrats have, have a very huge problem here in that this provides Donald Trump cover. It provides Donald Trump a way to very much muddy the situation. In fact, frankly, if, if Joe Biden's not on the ballot, uh, the president can still muddy it and say, what did Biden do or didn't do? But if he's off the ballot, the Democrat, I assume it would be Elizabeth Warren, will say, hey, you know, I'm not Joe Biden. That's the past. I'm the future. We're going to move forward. We're going to move beyond this stuff. And, and it gives the Democrats a message. Uh, it's not going to be Bernie Sanders. Uh, Bernie Sanders, by the way, has come out against charter schools. I've got some Bernie Sanders audio you need to need to hear. Also, this amazing audio from the, this, this wackadoo left-wing American woman in Hong Kong who's trying to tell the Hong Kong people fighting for their lives uh, that they're ridiculous for wanting freedom.
Yeah, you will. You, you, if you haven't seen this, if you haven't heard this, you got to hear this. I'll play the audio. We'll move on from impeachment when we come back. I, I want to reiterate a controversial point that I, I actually do believe. I, I think stuff like this makes it harder for the president to get reelected. Uh, in fact, I, I I don't know that I think the president wins reelection. Uh, and while you or I may vote for him. I don't think he wins re-election with stuff like this. I, I really don't, um, because I think intuitively the American people understand it's gross, and they don't necessarily want him impeached, but they also think it's bad, and the only way to really punish him as a voter for doing this is to not vote don't vote for him. The question, though, will be on the Democratic side of whether or not they moderate their tone moving forward, and do they present people with an acceptable alternative where they can then uh, express their disdain for the president. I'll tell you one person who they probably better not support is is Bernie Sanders, who's now come out against charter schools. Proposal that I brought forth on education ends all private charter schools in this country. Tonight, tonight I say to the city of Chicago, sign a contract with the unions that does not expand charter schools in Chicago. Opposed to charter schools, charter schools deeply popular, by the way, with black moms, um, deeply popular with black mothers, and they, he wants to get rid of it. That's not going to go over well. Um, meanwhile, the president understands he's got to hold on to his base, and that's probably why any sort of gun control measure or anything else like that is, is off the table. Because the president understands that he's got to hold on to that base. In the same way, the president can't do anything on on climate change. You know, there were some reporters yesterday saying, hmm, the president has softened his tone on climate change. Clearly, he's seen the polls of suburban mothers who are concerned. Well, he can't advance that agenda either because he's got to hold on to the base, and the base is not ready, ready to concede that point to the Democrats. He's got issues on both fronts. Um, here's the president yesterday, as a matter of fact, talking about religious liberty at the United Nations. This got a lot of buzz among Christians uh, who have the president's back on this stuff. Expressing their deeply held religious beliefs. So hard to believe. Today, with one clear voice, the United States of America calls upon the nations of the world to end religious persecution. <laughs> To stop the crimes against people of faith, release prisoners of conscience, repeal laws restricting freedom of religion and belief, protect the vulnerable, the defenseless, and the oppressed. America stands with believers in every country who ask only for the freedom to live according to the faith that is within their own hearts. As president, protecting religious freedom is one of my highest priorities and always has been yeah listen uh, i think that the president standing up for religious liberty is is one of those i don't want to use the phrase dog whistle that that's so overblown but you you, you know what i mean by that Un- unfortunately e- conservative voters understand democrats are out to get them Conservative voters understand Democrats hate their values. Conservative voters understand that they need someone in the White House because the the days of of Democrats persecuting Christians is upon us in this country. And Donald Trump is the only one, apparently, who wants to stand up and and make that fight. He has a real appreciation for uh, Christian liberty in this country, religious freedom, the country's founding, in a way that the Democrats don't. The United States is founded on the principle that our rights do not come from government. They come from God. This immortal truth is proclaimed in our Declaration of Independence and enshrined in the First Amendment to our Constitution's Bill of Rights. Our founders understood that no right is more fundamental to a peaceful, prosperous, and virtuous society than the right to follow one's religious convictions. Regrettably, The religious freedom enjoyed by American citizens is rare in the world. Approximately 80% of the world's population live in countries where religious liberty is threatened, restricted, or even banned. And when I heard that number, I said, please go back and check it because it can't possibly be correct. 
And sadly, it was 80 percent. As we speak, Jews, Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, Sikhs, Yazidis, and many other people of faith are being jailed, sanctioned, tortured, and even murdered, often at the hands of their own government, simply for expressing their deeply held religious beliefs. Yeah, you know, I mean, the president, he does stuff like this, and he keeps evangelicals with him. He keeps social conservatives with him. But, you know, I can't help but think there is a lot of resentment privately among evangelicals who are kind of tired of this. They have fond memories of what it used to be when you didn't have to defend the president all the time for stuff like this. And I think, uh, you know, if the president came out today and said, I- I've made America great again and can hand over the country now to the next president of the United States, Mike Pence, you'd have a lot of conservatives who treat Donald Trump as, as a hero of a generation. But that's not going to happen, is it? That's kind of sad. Well, we got to move on to, to white people telling oppressed people that they're not oppressed or they should like their oppression. Final takeaway on the impeachment stuff, having read the transcript live on air, I mean, you could literally hear me, see me on Facebook, uh, realizing that this wasn't nearly as big a deal as people were saying it was. Um, The Democrats will pursue impeachment, but if this is all there is, there's no way Republicans in the Senate turn on the president. They don't like the president, but they're not going to turn on the president over something like this. And they're not going to turn on the president over something like this because they're There isn't a big there there. Now, if the Democrats are able to show that the president did withhold that Ukrainian money uh, to get them to go after Joe Biden, then, yeah, you you may actually see them do something. You you may actually see the Republicans turn on the president. But until there's a there there, I don't see we we do that. Now, I want to move on to a couple of things. One of them in Georgia, the rise of hemp farming in Georgia. Yes, that is a story. We should talk about it. But first, I got to play this audio for you. Uh, This was audio captured. It's gone viral of an American woman who goes to Hong Kong to view the protesters. And it it perfectly encapsulates uh, progressivism versus conservatism. Listen to this. By the way, it's it's funny to hear a progressive saying it's a waste of time to protest the Chinese. This is not a waste of time. No. Look, is this is this okay? Is this respectful? Why not? Why not? If my mother saw me wrote this, how did you do it? What did you do? I'm not saying what they did is is wrong. They don't respect us. They're wrong too. They're wrong too. So look, look, violence breeds violence. Do you agree? Do you agree? Violence. There's find me one one case where violence led to a good solution. I think for them, the point is at some point, the only way to protect freedom is to give up. Okay, you, you're right. So the problem is, it's not the five demands. It's you guys value freedom more than safety. Do we agree? Okay, so I think safety is more important than freedom. If you have a safe environment, you can communicate. Don't you love these? Like, if you have a safe environment, you can communicate? Like... This is the perfect divide here. The, the You guys value freedom over safety, and she values safety because in a safe environment, you can communicate. This very much is socialism, communism, progressivism versus conservatism, uh, actual real liberalism, uh, the safety versus freedom divide. And here you've got some, some white American going to Hong Kong to talk down to protesters who literally could be killed at any moment by a ruthless communist regime, and she's basically telling them to to suck it up and and support the communists. Uh, Easy for her to say since she knows nothing will ever happen. It makes you wonder almost if if she's gone in there uh, to help the communists explicitly. I have no idea, but I just I wanted to play that clip for you because it really does sum up uh, what we deal with. And, you know, if this is sort of the voice and face of the Democrats headed into 2020, maybe the president survives. But I just, yeah, I think the president's got some problems. This stuff does not help him with Ukraine. I don't think it's impeachable, but it certainly makes it very, very difficult, I think, for a lot of Americans who are on the fence to say, 
yeah, he's my guy. But, you know, if the Democrats go crazy, they got Bernie Sanders out there wanting to get rid of charter schools. Yeah, maybe so. By the way, did you know the Labor um, the Labor Party in Great Britain, they're having their political conference. They have come out in favor of banning private schools. All private schools, including religious private schools, would be banned um, according to the Labor Party. Wow. Now, can we shift back to Georgia? A, a hodgepodge day because of impeachment. Let's come home to Georgia. And let's talk about weed. Well, more specifically, hemp. Um, Andy Peck wants to start growing hemp plants in Decula. Like a lot of farmers across Georgia, he's worried that government regulation will stifle the new industry. Uh, Peck would not be allowed to sell hemp to anyone except processing companies. But processing companies don't exist in Georgia. Under the rules, he wouldn't be allowed to ship his products outside of Georgia. But out-of-state producers could bring their hemp here. With such an uncertain market, he doesn't know whether hemp would even be profitable. Georgia lawmakers legalized hemp farming this year. Peck and 71 other people have submitted public comments to the State Department of Agriculture, almost all of them expressing concerns about the proposed regulations. The way they proposed it isn't going to work for Georgia farmers, said Peck who would like to grow hemp alongside violas, ferns, perennials, annuals, and other flowers in greenhouses on his 21 acres at Quail Hollow Nurseries. We want to make sure Georgia's competitive like the rest of the South. The way the laws are written now, we won't be. Hemp is a non-psychoactive form of the cannabis plant that's primarily used to make CBD oil, a popular product marketed as a remedy for muscle pain, anxiety, insomnia, seizures, Unlike marijuana, which also comes from cannabis, hemp contains less than 0.3% THC, the compound that allows marijuana users to achieve a high. While Georgians can buy CBD oil, uh, good Lord, you can buy it at the gas station up the street from me. The product is farmed, processed, and shipped from out of state. 41 states have hemp farming programs. Georgia farmers want to get in on the action, but they're waiting for the... Uh, regulation. Uh, they're trying to overrate egg everything, says Warren Hanchi of Whole Leaf, uh, Whole Leaf Company, a business that grows in Colorado and Oregon. He lives in Johns Creek, uh, Warren Hanchi does, lives in Johns Creek. They're trying to overregulate everything. We're trying to create all new steps in Georgia to grow the hemp. I'm afraid it's going to lead to disaster for the farmers getting into it. If approved, a hemp grower license would cost $50 per acre, up to $5,000 maximum. Hemp processors would have to pay $25,000 up front and $10,000 every year thereafter. Essentially, what Georgia wants to do is they want to legalize growing hemp without actually letting people grow hemp. Uh, they, they know there's a big way, but here's the problem. You're seeing this around the state now with uh, local police officers who are essentially legalizing marijuana by saying they're not going to arrest people if you have marijuana. I, I, I'm assuming you all have paid attention to this. We've talked about this here. I, I think in Athens, in Augusta, in Paulding County, in Livonia, in Clarkston, um, Gwinnett County, I think, is one of them. Somewhere in Fulton. I, I can't. There are a lot of places around the state um, where... Local prosecutors are now saying we're not going to arrest kids who have marijuana because the kids can say it's hemp and we don't have a test to determine the potency. So we're not going to arrest anybody. Now, what UGA is actually saying, and if you're in the uh, Clark, if you're listening on WGAU in, in Athens, don't breathe a sigh of relief here because what the Clark County police are saying is that they're going to save all the stuff. And as soon as the test is ready from the GBI, they're going to test it. And if it was marijuana, they're going to come get you. Can we be real honest? If a kid is walking down Broad Street with a little bag of of hemp or marijuana in his pocket. What do you really think he's got in his pocket? I don't know anybody who's going to walk down the street carrying hemp. They're smoking weed. In fact, one of the sheriffs, oh, in what county was it? I want to say it was Cherokee County, maybe, um, the Woodstock area. That sheriff said this is nuts. He's not about to go along with, with not prosecuting people. That if, if you got a young person smelling like weed on the sidewalk, with bloodshot eyes and weed in the pocket, and they say it's hemp, you know they're lying, so arrest them. Uh, yeah, I think the the um, the Savannah, the, the DA in Savannah is taking the same position. 
that nobody's walking around smoking hemp or carrying hemp around. It's all weed, and, and they're going to take it out. Well, the problem, though, is that you do have 41 states that are allowing growing hemp. And my understanding from someone who called into the program to, to educate me on this stuff a while back is that um, hemp and marijuana really are the same plant. It, it's just a, the pollinization of hemp causes uh, the THC levels to go up, which produces marijuana. Don't hold me to that. That's what I was told. That they are essentially the same. You can't look at hemp and marijuana and think they're two different things. That they they are derived from the same thing, from the same plant. It's just the THC levels are off. Uh, one has been bred for more potent uh, THC, and you can't tell. I mean, that's the other thing here is you cannot tell. The reason that the uh, Georgia Department of Agriculture wants to crack down on this is, for example, I, so I got a buddy of mine. Buddy of mine lives in Atlanta. Down in middle Georgia, very near me, I, 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 I won't go into the details too far, but he bought 100 acres of hunting land in middle Georgia. And people kept snapping the lock off his gate and were going in and messing with the stuff. And he was concerned. And so he and his brother-in-law set up trail cams and they noticed that people were uh, going into the back of his property to a part he had not yet explored. He knew that there were there was creeks and streams and stuff in the back of his property. He just hadn't gotten his four-wheelers down there to go check it out. So he and his brother-in-law, they, they get their trailers and they take their four-wheelers down. They get guns on them and they go to the back of their property. And someone has uh, carved out an acre or so of his land at the back of his property and is growing marijuana. And of course he freaks out. He's he's a city boy. He thinks that the DEA is going to be down there stealing his taking his property, throwing him in jail. He's got uh, various licenses, he's got a professional licenses he's got to keep up. And so he goes to the sheriff's office and says, uh, y'all gotta come do something. Somebody's growing marijuana at the back of my property. They're they're trespassing on my property, they're growing marijuana, it's not mine. Uh, I'm coming here lawfully, legally, I'm 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 taking care of this and the sheriff's deputy's like, y'all ain't from around here, are you? <laughs> Apparently, it happens all over the place in middle Georgia and south Georgia. People growing uh, marijuana on the back of their property. Now, I got a buddy of mine who lives down the street from me. I mean, I, I am, I, I'm looking out my window and through the, the clearing of the trees, I can, I can see down to where his house is. And he's got uh, woods behind his house. And when he went out there and somebody had cleared out uh, um, part behind his house and someone was growing marijuana. He said, there are like five or six marijuana plants growing and, th- and they were tiny. And he finally figured out it was his next door neighbor's kid, next door neighbor's son. It's always boys. His next door neighbor's son was growing marijuana, had cleared out this little area in the woods, got enough sunlight and was growing marijuana. And it had just started out. And I said, are, are you going to tell his dad? He says, nope. I said, well, why, why, why aren't you going to tell his dad? He says, because winter's coming. said, <laughs> those plants will be dead in about four weeks. <laughs> he says, I know from personal experience. <laughs> but, you know, apparently this, this is a big thing. And, and so the, the reason the Department of Agriculture is requiring these licenses and fees is because if someone reports you and says you're growing marijuana, well, if you have the paperwork showing that you're growing marijuana or that you're growing hemp, uh, they'll give you a pass. But if you don't have the paperwork, then they'll presume it's marijuana and they will burn your field and possibly arrest you. Uh, this is all about regulating the industry and making sure that uh, we're not at the point of having recreational weed in Georgia, which I got to tell you, we pretty much have a recreational weed situation in Georgia. It is becoming more and more common. I was in McDonald's. Now, this was at the end of the last school year, but there was a there was a kid in front of me. Everything you need to know is summed up in this. He was driving a brand new Corvette with a vanity plate. And he and his girlfriend were in the car at the drive through at McDonald's smoking marijuana. And they were very I mean, it was very obvious they were smoking marijuana. He, the woman at the drive through looked at me. She's like, should I call the cops? It's like, I, I think they're going back across the street to the school. There's a school across the street from McDonald's, and I'm pretty sure they were on their lunch break. And then a, a couple of weeks later, there were these two kids, and, and I noticed they were in an old beat-up car, and they kept staring at me a little awkwardly. And I finally just kind of smiled and waved, at which point the kid pulls out his joint and starts smoking, and he's very clearly smoking weed, uh, very obviously in both smell and smoke and everything, and and. Clearly, these two had been at it for a while. And they were in their car, by the way. Two of these, they're all teenagers in their car. 
it is becoming increasingly common. You you walk down the street in Atlanta or Athens or Savannah. You, I was on the river in Savannah not that long ago, and you could smell one of the boats going by. It is becoming more and more open as it's become legal out west. And, you know, there was a story in Wired magazine. I, I think it was in Wired about how you've got people in particularly Georgia. Georgia is one of the hotbeds of this who are paired up with distributors in California and Colorado Farmers who have excess capacity because of regulations in the state, a lot of farmers in those states now sell on the black market. In addition to the legal market in California, they can sell stronger stuff in the black market, and they're paired up with people in Georgia, and they funnel it across the country. Oftentimes, it's people on road trips, supposedly, who drive out there and drive it back. And with uh, Paulding County and Cobb County and Gwinnett County and and the like out there saying they're not going to prosecute, uh, low-level drug possession, it's just going to get even worse. And the Department of Agriculture is scrambling with what to do. The legislature wants to legalize the growing of hemp in Georgia. There is no test at the GBI to tell the potency, so they got to do something. And the way they've come up with it is tax. They're going to tax the snot out of farmers who want to grow hemp. They're going to make it ridiculously burdensome, so you got to have high capital costs uh, in order to do it. And in so doing it, uh, they'll be able to say, okay, you're you're legit, because you got the money to pay it and to grow it and to deal with the processors. And the rest of you, we're just going to burn your fields and possibly arrest you. That's This is a government we're talking about. When governments decide to do something, typically their fallback plan is they're just going to regulate you and possibly put you out of existence uh, because that's how they control the market. It is the inescapable conversation today. Let me just read you the, the links at the top of the Drudge Report right now. Trump asks Ukraine president if you can look into Biden's son and phone call. Push to work with Giuliani Barr. Intel officials referred activity to DOJ for criminal inquiry. Declined. George Conway, that's Kellyanne's husband, predicts Republicans vote against Trump on impeachment. Senate passes unanimous resolution demanding whistleblower complaint. Executive privilege battle looms. Washington Post leads Wednesday removal of U.S. ambassador in Ukraine, latest twist. More Democrats back impeachment, 207 and counting. Andrew Johnson, Bill Clinton, and Trump. Freshmen, these allegations are a threat to all we have sworn to protect. Napolitano, is it a crime? President will now go to war against intelligence community. Inquiry casts spotlight on spy chief. Pelosi, tepid no more. Witch hunt garbage. Risky Trump meeting with Ukraine President High Wire Act. But wait, there's more. Impeachment 2019, only fourth time in history. Transcript release, you can read it for yourself. Oh, boy. Um, We're not going to be able to escape this, are we? The problem here really is, though, with the Republicans in the Senate. If the Republicans in the Senate, and, and let me just jump back to My analysis from yesterday was based on talking to Republicans. They've made a couple of uh, calculations. Calculation one is that the White House is in play, that they do have a shot. Calculation two is that there is no way the House is in play. Calculation three is the Senate is safe. And calculation four is that they'll preserve enough state legislatures to draw favorable lines for redistricting. If the variables that form those calculations start to change, then everything else is off, and in particular the polling. If the American people turn against the president on this and the polling goes deeply against the Republicans, then they will turn on the president. Until Republicans are convinced the public is against the president— then the Republicans will not be against the president. It is a political calculation. You can say it's right. You can say it's wrong. You can say it's the law. You can say high crimes and misdemeanors all you want to. You're blue in the face. But the reality is impeachment is political. Impeachment is not a trial per se. It is not in a judicial branch. It is in the political branch. It is in the most political branch. And the Republicans will not change their view of impeachment until the political forces change. And the political forces will be poll-tested changes. Are Republicans in Republican states going wobbly? More particularly, are Republicans in swing districts going wobbly? Let's bring this all the way back into Georgia now. Lucy McBath in the 6th Congressional District. Behind the scenes, people have been saying Lucy McBath wanted to come out for impeachment, and she never did. It's telling that she hasn't actually done anything related to impeachment. In fact, yesterday, a bunch of reporters tried to get her on record, and she ran away from them. She didn't want to go on record with them. 
Democrats, I, I think there's become an echo chamber between progressive Democrats and reporters because progressive Democrats and reporters are saying, you know, the moderates are coming on board. The moderates, the freshman moderates, they're, they want impeachment. They want to impeach the president. Let, let's impeach the president. The moderates are okay. It's very interesting that the moderate Democrats are in hiding right now. It doesn't appear that they are lined up with what the Democrats have said in the past. It doesn't appear that the moderate Democrats are fully on board with the spin from the media that the moderates are now ready to get the president. Certainly some more have, but not all of them. And in fact, uh, you got people like Lucy McBath in a district that leans Republican, but she won it in 2018, who she's gone into hiding. She doesn't want to talk to the reporters at all. That deeply suggests the reality is that the Democrats are not as fully on board impeachment as they had been. So what's going to happen now is is Pelosi, they're not doing a select committee. They're not putting all the chairmen on a committee. They're not putting one committee together to look at all of this. They're letting the committees do their work as usual. And in letting the committees do their work as usual, what the Democrats are doing is going on a fishing expedition. And they're going to try their best to find evidence that the president needs to be impeached. And if they can find the evidence that the president needs to be impeached, then they will go for it. But will they? Because right now what they've got is not good for the president. But I would argue it's not impeachable for the president. It certainly looks like the president wanted Ukraine to look into Joe Biden. But, you know, he's the chief law enforcement officer of the country. He's the chief executive officer of the country. He can ask a, a foreign government to see if they were pressured to do something by a former president or vice president uh, for corrupt purposes. And and the president really does believe that Joe Biden was doing this to help Hunter Biden. He really does believe there was a corrupt purpose. Well, then he's got a legitimate reason to look into it. Whether you agree with him or not, he's got a legitimate reason. It doesn't look good for the president, though. If he did withhold money, I would argue it's impeachable, but we're not there yet with this. There's still time to shape the situation, and the Democrats are going to do their best to shape it, but will the public even care with an election coming next year?